Some people buy a sports car to take off and some to show off. But at Honda, we made a sports car for grown-ups. The Honda Prelude, a sports car for grown-ups. The fact that the Honda Prelude was initially marketed as a sports car for grown-ups might just be one of the most ironic things I've ever heard. Let's just say that of the remaining preludes that haven't yet been wrapped around poles, the percentage of them still able to go over speed bumps is extremely low. So today let's do a deep dive and look at the rise, fall, and possible reincarnation of the Honda Prelude. Let's start off by jumping all the way back to 1979 and looking at the Prelude's humble beginnings. As you can see, in contrast to the flashier Preludes that would come later, the original Prelude was really quite understated. The Prelude was heavily based on the first generation Accord, but was on an all new smaller chassis with independent suspension on all four corners. The Prelude body was overall shorter than the Accord, with a longer hood line and short trunk lid. Remember that at the time, neither the Civic nor Accord was available in a coupe, so the Prelude was Honda's first entry into the sports coupe market. Now, admittedly, calling this front-wheel drive 72 horsepower 1.8 liter a sports coupe seems a little generous, but I guess Honda was on the mark with their mature sports car for grown-ups angle because this is definitely the car Bill from accounting might buy rather than Chad from shipping. The interior was very driver-focused with most controls and dials within easy reach from the steering wheel. The instrument cluster was rather unique with two concentric dials in the center, the speedo being the outer ring and the tack the inner ring. Inside of those, a cluster housed most of the vehicle's warning lights. I I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this in any other car. This gauge cluster did receive a fair bit of criticism at the time, but I appreciate that Honda did something different with the Prelude interior instead of just reusing the Accord gauge cluster. Nowadays, manufacturers tend to just throw the exact same interior in all of their models, and Honda has been especially guilty of this lately. There was a temp and fuel gauge on the left, and the right side had Honda's trademark car diagram, which showed an open door, trunk lid, or even a burnt out brake light bulb. On automatic models, there was also a digital display which showed you which gear you were in, which was pretty cool for 1979. In 1981, the Prelude had a mid-model run refresh which eliminated the concentric dial gauge cluster for a more traditional gauge cluster. I think this was a step backwards personally and made the interior of the Prelude lose a lot of its uniqueness, but it was done in response to not being received very well by potential customers. I guess it was just a little too far out there for Bill from accounting. He likes balanced spreadsheets and traditional symmetrical gauges. In 1983, North America received the second generation Prelude, a complete redesign from the ground up. The new larger Prelude was longer and wider but retained the same height. It had greatly improved aerodynamics thanks to a much more sloped hood line with pop-up headlights that, in addition to adding that classic 80s sports car styling flair, helped reduce the drag coefficient down to 0.36 from 0.43 on the previous model. Speaking of pop-up headlights, I read an article from a 1983 edition of Road & Track that said initially Honda wanted a different headlight design, where the headlights would rise up from behind translucent plastic covers. When in the down position, the dimmer light that made it through the translucent covers would act as your daytime running lights. Perhaps that thick black trim that runs across the headlight covers when in the down position is a leftover remnant of this. How cool would it be if that black line was actually translucent and illuminated as your running lights? Unfortunately, there were too many federal regulations that got in the way of this, so Honda Honda went with pop-up headlights instead. Under the hood, the initial engine we got was a 1.8 liter twin carbureted CVCC inline four, which made about 101 horsepower. Well, if you want to get technical, there was actually three carburetors. A third smaller carb between the main side draft carburetors fed the pre-chambers. Now that may sound complicated and intimidating to work on, but it's really, oh God. Now 101 horsepower may seem pretty pitiful by today's standards, but this was 1983. And remember cars were much lighter back then. The Prelude at just around 2,200 pounds was actually pretty nimble with this power output, and its 0-60 to 60 time was 9.7 seconds. And while your family odyssey can beat that time today, and it needs to, because otherwise Shannon in her Sienna gets to soccer practice first, in 1983 this was respectable and considerably better than the 11.8 second time of the Toyota Celica GTS of the time, probably the Prelude's main competition. The Prelude came standard with a 5-speed manual, as it should, but there was also an optional 4-speed automatic. For some reason the automatic had power steering, but the manual didn't even have power steering as an option. Still, the handling feel of the Prelude was one of the vehicle's high points and the lack of power steering really only got annoying in parking lots. Now let's take a moment to look at the Prelude's interior. I actually really liked it. 
other than that awful steering wheel which looks out of an 80s spaceship that didn't age well. Everything was really driver's focused. I liked the amber lighting for the gauges. We had all the info we needed. Also, check out that sick cassette deck and equalizer. Now starting in 1985, the Prelude offered an SI model. This gave the Prelude a two liter fuel injected engine and pumped power output to 110 horsepower. 1986 gave us a facelift that connected the rear tail lights with a solid line of red rather than the black trim line that previously separated them. We also got a new simple yet that very nice three dial gauge cluster design which Honda would end up using variations of on many models throughout the rest of the 80s and 90s. And thank the heavens we got a new steering wheel. I'm not gonna lie I unapologetically like these old preludes and I would buy one today if there were any left. But as nice as these ones were what would come next was even better. It's late 1987, the Princess Bride, Predator, and Spaceballs are all playing at your local movie theater, and Honda just released the third generation prelude for the 1988 model year. What a time to be alive. No wonder people didn't need the internet to entertain them back then. The new prelude styling was a clear evolution from the previous generation, but slashes the drag coefficient down to an even lower 0.34. Ultra high strength metal used in the roof pillars allowed them to be narrower, which made for amazing visibility. And perhaps their most signature feature was available four wheel steering. This Prelude was powered by a variant of Honda's B20A engine. The base model was initially still a twin carb single overhead cam 12 valve 2 liter making about 104 horsepower. The SI used a fuel injected dual overhead cam 16 valve 2 liter rated at 135 horsepower. The engine was tilted backwards at an angle of 18 degrees to allow for this Prelude's extremely low hood line. I'm happy to say that the hood hinges were now at the back where they belong. Honda was finally done with their front hinged hoods. I know the front hinged hood can kind of look like a cute novelty at first, until you try to work on one. Try pulling a radiator out of one of these front hinged hood cars and you'll be screaming at Honda to get those hinges back at the windshield where they belong. The interior was simple but nice. It wasn't really all that different from the post facelift interior of the second gen. Everything was just kinda, well, more rounded with 100% less yellow. I think the interior looks refined, clean, and uncomplicated. This is a car you just get in and drive without having to watch a YouTube tutorial on how to reset your trip meter. Now let's talk about performance. Numbers for the SI model published in a 1988 edition of Road and Track showed a zero to 60 time of 9.3 seconds. That's only about a half second faster than the previous SI and oh, look at that. Our friend the Celica GTS is back and he has not only caught up to us, but surpassed us, at least for straight line acceleration with a time of 8.6 seconds. However, if we look at the slalom speed, at 65.5 miles per hour, the Prelude was able to whip through those cones significantly faster than the Celica, thanks in part to that four-wheel steering. If a car could make it through here at 55 miles an hour, it would be a miracle. No, it's the new Prelude Si with four-wheel steering. I guess this is a good time to talk about that four-wheel steering. I know there are a lot of four-wheel steering fanboys out there, but honestly, was it really that good? <laughs> It was an expensive option, and in Motor Week's review of the 1988 Prelude, they point out that the difference between the two-wheel steering and four-wheel steering cars was really only noticeable under high-speed aggressive driving conditions, and I highly doubt that most people who bought these cars knew were tracking them or whipping through parking cone slaloms. Bill from Accounting certainly wasn't. Now there was another advantage to the four-wheel steering, and that was low-speed maneuverability. A really small turning radius and the ability to turn sharper than normal at low speeds made the four-wheel steering very helpful when trying to parallel park or get out of a tight spot in a crowded parking garage. But at a cost of $1,400 in 1988 money just to be able to parallel park easier, was this option really worth it? To be honest, I don't really have a judgment on this because I haven't yet had the opportunity to drive a four-wheel steering prelude, but if any of you have, I'd be curious to know what you think, so let me know down in the comments. In 1990, the prelude received its usual mid-run facelift. Revised turn signals and tail lamps now had clear lenses with amber bulbs, and the backup lights were moved up to blend in with the turn signals. A new front bumper also had fog lights and daytime running lights alongside a now clear lens turn signal. There were new wheels and a slightly revised interior. With the new steering wheel and a slightly revised instrument cluster. This really was a simple yet good looking interior and I love this era of Hondas with their teal dash light illumination before they made everything boring and white. Also check out this awesome feature. This mechanical memory device restored the seat back to its previous tilt angle after you released it forward to let someone in their back seat so you wouldn't have to readjust it. Why didn't they put this in any of their other cars? My Integra could really use this. My CL doesn't even have this and that's supposed to be a luxury coupe. The carbureted engine was gone and the base model now had the 
135 horsepower 2 liter fuel injected engine. The SI had a new 2.1 liter 140 horsepower engine, the B21A or A1 depending on the market. This was the first Prelude engine to use that special fiber reinforced metal cylinder wall lining meant to be extremely tough. And it is extremely tough. So tough in fact that it wears out the piston rings causing the engine to go through almost as much oil as your Uncle Jack does whiskey. But hey, is it really a Honda engine if it doesn't have worn piston rings and excessively consume oil? I think these post facelift 9091 preludes are the best looking and maybe just the best overall preludes ever. I'd love to own one but they are super rare now and a halfway decent one costs literally close to $20,000. I'm not even joking, that's what they go for now. That's more than they were new. The people who bought them like seven or eight years ago for like $2,700 are laughing all the way to the bank. Unless they already chopped off the exhaust, lowered it to the pavement, and ripped the oil pan off trying to get into their driveway. That's probably what happened to most of these preludes and it's really sad. All right, it's 1992 and we've got a brand new prelude. Here's hoping they don't ruin the franchise like Alien just did. Now what I want to talk about first is actually the interior because I think that's the most polarizing thing about this generation of Prelude. Honda went a little different with this interior. It's very spaceship inspired. I think that's the look they were going for. I think this was one of those interiors that people either loved or hated and I can see how some people might think this is really cool but I'm a little nervous because Honda tried an unconventional interior in a Prelude once before and it didn't go over so well with their target market. I just don't see Bill from Accounting being a big fan of this interior. But then again, I would think by now Honda's changed their marketing strategy for these cars. I don't see the mature sports car for growing up slogan anymore, and this to me looks like a car that would be targeted towards young single profession. My advice to you is get a prelude. Okay, I don't understand Honda's marketing strategy for the prelude at all. No wonder this car failed. Under the hood, North American Preludes had one of three options. Base models used the single overhead cam 2.2 liter F22A1 rated at 133 horsepower shared with the Honda Accord. The SI model had a dual overhead cam 2.3 liter rated at 158 horsepower and starting in 1993 you could get the VTEC Prelude which gave you a dual overhead cam VTEC 2.2 liter with 187 horsepower. That's a pretty impressive number for a four cylinder car from 1993 and it both Posted a pretty respectable 0 to 60 time of 6.3 seconds. Four wheel steering was still an available option on the SI models but was now electronically controlled in contrast to the purely mechanical system on the previous generation. All VTEC models had leather interior and in Canada we got a few extra things like heated mirrors and optional heated seats so we could warm up after leaving our igloos. Despite how capable and well equipped this new Prelude was, the sales numbers for the Prelude which had been steadily dropping since the start of the new decade did not see much of an uptick. By the mid 90s, the Prelude was at its lowest sales numbers ever since its 1979 introduction. The car that had been selling over 80,000 units a year in the mid 80s could no longer crest over 20,000 a year by the mid 90s. So why wasn't the Prelude selling so well anymore? Was it the unorthodox interior styling? Was it being marketed to the wrong demographic? Or maybe the competition was starting to outdo the Prelude? Well if we look at the Toyota Celica's mid 90s numbers, they were actually dropping pretty steadily too. But what about Honda's internal competition? Competition. The Acura Integra was growing in popularity at this time, and the available GSR with its dual overhead cam VTEC engine outperformed the SI Prelude and was only a little bit behind the VTEC Prelude when it came to its performance numbers. But keep in mind, in 1994, the GSR Integra had an MSRP of just under $20,000, while the VTEC Prelude had an MSRP of just under $25,000. And it's hard to justify an extra $5,000 of 1994 money for the Prelude over the Integra even if it was just slightly faster. Plus, in my opinion, the Integra gave you way nicer styling inside and out and added the practicality of a hatchback. By 1996, the Prelude sales numbers had dropped to just over 12,000 units, but Honda would give the Prelude one last chance at life with one more complete redesign for 1997. <laughs> generation Prelude tried to call back to some of its older design cues to distance it from the not so well received fourth generation. This meant a long hood line with a short trunk lid and a more square looking exterior design. The only problem was this long, almost luxury car like front end made the car have a 63-37 front to back weight distribution considerably worse than the 5842 of the previous generation. Still though, Honda's double wishbone suspension and Honda's super handling system on the SH model, which was an electronically controlled 
controlled torque vectoring system allowed the car to retain very good handling. There were two models in North America, BASE and SH, and there was only one engine option. The H22A4 2.2 liter dual overhead cam VTEC rated at 190 horsepower on the automatics and 195 horsepower on the manual transmission cars. In 1999, this would bump up to 195 and 200 horsepower, respectively. The interior went back to a much more conventional, typical 90s Honda style, but still differentiated itself from the Accords or Civics. It had a simple, effective layout with high quality touch materials. I definitely like this interior a lot better than the previous generation, and in general, I think this is a good looking car inside and out with a rather timeless design that still holds up today. Unfortunately, though, this wasn't enough to turn things around. Prelude sales continued to drop year after year. Now, our old friend the Celica was actually able to rebound in 1999 after almost completely flatlining with a fresh redesign that allowed it to live on with somewhat decent sales until 2005. But this just wasn't the case for the Prelude which by the 2000 model year couldn't even sell 10,000 units in the US. And putting the Celica aside, Honda had plenty of internal competition at this point when it came to a four-cylinder front-wheel drive sport coupe. There was the amazing 99-2000 Civic Si, the Integra, the Accord Coupe, the Acura 2.3 CL, and this was a time when sports coupes in general both front wheel drive and rear wheel drive were being discontinued. This age was really the rise of SUVs in North America. And so 2001 was the last model year for the Prelude, selling 9,462 units in the US. The Prelude left behind a strong legacy and they are still very popular with Honda enthusiasts, even the younger ones who were barely alive when the last Prelude rolled off the production line. Which again makes me think that aside from maybe the first generation, I don't think Bill from Accounting was ever the right demographic to target these cars to. But then again, younger people probably couldn't afford them new and as such were buying the Civic Si instead. And that was the rise and fall of the Honda Prelude.